So there's been all proposals for new types of trains, or faster trains like Hyperloop, Maglevs, and some of all that exists. And I want to go over my own idea that's, I think, better than all these other ideas, not to be too boastful. But all these ideas are trying to combat a couple different efficiency losses. First of all, we have the efficiency loss of gaining the power to the axle vehicle or train. If it's gas or coal, you have to put the gas and coal on it and carry a lot of weight, and then it's also delivering gas and coal. But then we have electricity, and now we have electric lines, so you don't have to carry a battery even. So it becomes a lot more efficient that way. And then you have ways of transmitting it better with um, high voltage and stuff that people are working in it, and other ways of transforming it in better conductors. So you have those ones. Then you have the engine. Well, electric engines are some of the most efficient engines. Not the most efficient, not always, but almost always they're like twice the amount or more than the gas engines. Then you have um lo then you have loss with the gears and friction with the wheels turning. And that can be quite significant, but we've really come a long way of dealing with that. But then you have friction due to the against the track and the wheels against the members to the weight of the train compressing the whole thing. That is one of the most significant. And the one is air friction. Now the weight of the train pushing down is a function of the weight of the train pushing down and friction of the axle tires. So if you can lift the train up, there's less friction and less problem there. Or if you can pump out the air, there's less air drag. The problem with um, pumping out, the problem with each of them is they still require energy to lift the whole thing and superconductors and stuff that could lose power. Or the whole thing requires you to make a vacuum for the air reduction one, and making a vacuum is, quite, is incredibly air ten, um, energy intensive because you have to keep pumping out the air um, at first, and the more of perfect vacuum, the more energy intensive it is because every little last little bit is hard to pump out because there's fewer air to move around, and the air just can escape and move more easily around it. It's, it's a lot easier to move. If you look at going pool, it's easy to splash water in direction. Move your hand in air, which is a lot less viscous, it's a lot harder to make a force of air. Anyway, and that includes pumping it out. Then what happens if leaks can, small leaks would mess it up? What about explosive decompression? So if there's any hole in the train, the whole thing could explode. How do you onboard passengers? And all these different things, and it's a hardest thing to set up. I. I think I have a way around all these problems and the problems of turning lift to reduce friction. That's even more friction than um, the proposed maglevs. But first I want to go over different types of lift produced. The simplest type of lift and the most efficient is how balloons work. Balloons work in this very nice simple way in that they are just lighter than air and air then just pushes them up, and that's not be filled. And the reason why they push them up when they're lighter is because the heavier air just sinks to the bottom, and that just pushes that up. Very simple concept, compared to everything else with dynamic with stuff. You know, everything can, anything can be complicated. Now the next most efficient way of lifting things that does require some power is airfoils, and airfoils a bunch of different things, but how they work on planes and stuff to generate lift is that the air on top of it hugs the top of the curved airfoil. And there's other effects going on. I'm talking about the biggest effect. So it travels a distance greater than the distance on the bottom where it travels on more of a flat surface. Now sometimes there's other deviation stuff to optimize it that makes it more complicated, but let's just take this simple case. Now the flat surface, let's say it has travel 10 feet, and the top one has to travel 20 feet. I'm making up these numbers. Well, the top one, also the air tries to meet up at the end at the same time. Otherwise, there's a vacuum, because then there's, there's some air missing here. So because they're trying to travel so much faster, the top has faster moving air, and faster moving air actually has lower air pressure, 
You can see sometimes stuff gets sucked behind a car or something, and or sucked to other things moving, and that's actually due to this effect. Now this lower air pressure can be kind of also thought about if I'm throwing you a ball, and I can only throw a ball at this, catch a ball and throw at a set weight, and let's say I'm receiving a ball once every once a second, and as soon as I get it, I throw it. Well, if we speed up the amount of, uh, well, let's say I'm getting more balls than um, I can, if I'm getting balls and I throw them really fast to you at the rate they're coming in, there's the balls, the press is about even. Now, if I start throwing the ball slower, there's a buildup of balls. The balls get compressed. And it's more like I am getting, and that's me moving at slower speed. It's more like there's more air pressure because you start seeing the balls and I'm throwing two balls at a time or something because I'm getting overloaded. If I throw much faster, then it's like there's less balls in the same amount of time. In this, I'm sorry, in the same amount of areas, maybe periods of time when there's no balls in the air in between us, like there's less pressure. The third and final way of generating lift conventionally is um, just pushing downwards. And this is kind of what, what a helicopter does. A helicopter also uses the airfoil effect. It's a hybrid, but airplanes are using more efficient because they use more of the airfoil effect than a helicopter. Now, I couldn't find great numbers, but the best numbers I could find said that airfoil is about 10 times more efficient than just pushing it down ground. So if you had an airfoil effect on maybe a train, maybe you could use a lot less energy to lift the train up and reduce how much weight it is. But there's an even more efficient effect, and that's the ground effect. And people try to um, build the ground effect, but the ground effect is very hard to control if you don't have a tracks or defined surface like on a train. And the ground effect is about 2.3 times more efficient than the conventional lift. And what a ground effect does is it forces air underneath the vehicle and that air becomes pressurized and pushes the vehicle up. And it's only about, um, it's not that high you thought fly for the ground effect. They say it's about, you can fly a few times higher than the, a few, on the, it's proportional to how big the wings are usually. And yeah, the longer the wings, the higher it is. But it's only, like a big effect would be like 10 or 12 feet for a vehicle. So not that high. But how would this work with a train? Well, imagine now you had a train, and instead you had, this is my ugly train, this is the body, and you had some, and you had a head that is at an angle. And then you had a fan that pushes air against this head, and then fan might be angled itself, and there might be more than one fan, down under the vehicle to use, to lift this whole vehicle using the ground effect, and you might have marble fans. Now, this whole thing lifts the vehicle, lowering friction, but also this fan with the correct airflow design can actually also lower air friction, even though it's pushing more air significantly because it's lowering air pressure. And air foils also can even suck something in towards the air and cause air pressure to be friction from the air to even be negative in some ways. Powering this whole thing with almost no loss of due to air speed due to air friction and less loss due to friction against the track, and I believe more efficient than a maglev because you're using energy from the actual air kind of around you and more floating like a boat. Now, there are some big disadvantages of this system, and that is that fans are a lot less efficient than um, Fans are a lot less efficient than you have an electric motor that's turning something, but I think that'll make up. Fans can be anywhere from 50 to 70% efficient, where a direct wheel is more like upwards of 90% efficient, just moving stuff. But I'm using a fan more to reduce friction, so it's not as much of a worry there. And I can use the wheels also propelled forward in a combined way. 
Also, the wheels can help make the fan more efficient, actually, by moving more air into the steam path. Second thing is I put a little cover in front of the fan, which could be a simple fence or something like that, to block debris from coming in or bugs or something like that for safety. And that's going to reduce the efficiency of the fan to some extent. And because the fan is how it's pointed, the fan will not be tow vehicle will lose this kind of effect when it's making turns. So they would, this will be the greatest when it's not making turns. However, this whole thing could be more easily installed because it's the actual vehicle more, not the fancy new maglev technology or a new Hyperloop one. It also will be moving much more air than a conventional thing. So you would um, potentially it would make more noise or move more and more air. So it would only be able to really use this to its fullest extent outside of in, you would have to put probably sound barriers, but the sound barriers themselves could recover some energy of the fan moving to power stuff if you were to design them well. You could, or you would have to run the fan at less high speeds when it getting closer, but you could make a high efficiency actually quiet fan to significantly reduce it, but it still would be comparatively more breezy and noisy than some of the traditional ones. Well, thank you for listening very much. I hope you found this interesting. Please like and subscribe. It really helps the channel out. I'm trying to reach 1,000 subscribers in a year and 4,000 watch hours, which is really, really hard. But with your help, I think I can do it. Also, if you have any ideas for future videos, comments, or suggestions, please leave in the comment section below. Thank you very much.